I'm very excited about today, today's program. I finished re uh, to reading this novel recently, and I think it's one of the most amazing novels that I've read, I would say, easily in the last year or two. So if you haven't read it, it's beautiful. You'll hear more about it today. I cried. It was a little, I'm glad I was by myself. <laughs> but it's like funny, emotional. It has everything that makes a novel beautiful. So I'm excited to have Angie Cruz here today. Angie Cruz is the author of the novels How T Not to Drown in a Glass of Water, Soledad, Let It Rain Coffee, and Dominicana, which was sh shortlisted for the Woman's Prize and a Good Morning America Book Club pick. She is founder and editor-in-chief of Asterix, a literary and arts journal, and is associate professor of English at the University of, of Pittsburgh. Cruz will be in conversation with Lupita Aquino, which is amazing, and if you don't follow her in social media, you're missing a lot of good things, so you should follow her. Um, it, uh, she is in social media as Lupita Reads, so make sure you find her. Uh, better known as Lupita Reads is a passionate literary enthusiast, amplifying and highlighting books written by authors of color through her Instagram blog. She currently lives in the greater Washington DC area, and you can find her on Instagram, as I was saying, at lupita.reads, on Twitter at us at lupita underscore reads, or catch her writing about books for shereads.com or via her column over at Washington Independent Review of Books. So tonight, today, this morning, this afternoon, is an amazing opportunity for us, all of us that are here, because we're having two amazing um, women, uh, Angie Cruz and Lupita Reeds. And please, let's welcome them with an applause. Hi everyone, thank you so much Politics and Prose for inviting me. I'm so excited to celebrate my launch here in, wi in Washington DC of How Not to Drown in a Glass of Water. Um, I'm just gonna read a section of it so you get a, a sense of this character's voice and then we're gonna get to it and just talk. And we don't know what's gonna happen. We don't know. We're, we're gonna, gonna have a good time. We're gonna have a good time. Okay. Before you say something, I have to tell you, Alicia the Psychic wrote to me the day before I went to that interview. She said, Mercury is in retrograde. You don't know what that is? Every few months, for three to four weeks, communication is bad. So for example, you can't sign contracts. I told Angela this, but she put down the deposit to secure the house in Long Island. In some place called Shirley. You know the Shirley place? Yes, where the plane crashed in the 90s. Angela wants to live near the beach. She shows me many photos. I don't make opinions. But why does she want to go so far away where there are no people? She will be very aburrida, I am sure. Anyways, Alicia the Psychic said that I should not start something new like a job. Yes, in her letter, she said job. One must be very careful right now. It's not the time to make something happen. It is the time to stop and reflect. Alicia the Psychic also said someone, Dike, an old lover, will turn up the fire again. But she advised, I must be careful because it's a bad time for everything. Ha, an old lover looking for me? The last man that came to me in that way was Jose. It happened many times. I mean, many, 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 many times for many years but it was not a serious thing. You see, Jose owned the everything store on Broadway. It literally had one of everything and he kept the store full. And for things like a drill or a hammer, he would let us borrow it if we promised to bring it back in the same condition. It's incredible he stayed in business for so long because he didn't care about making money. One day I needed to copy a key. He was busy. So instead of making me wait, he promised to deliver to my apartment after he closed the store. When he came, I invited him in for un café. He must have liked how I made it, because he came many times after that. I didn't think much of his visits. He had a good woman in the house. 
We all liked the wife, La Cubana. Later, we found out she wasn't Cuban. She was from Venezuela. She was the cashier and put labels on everything so we could know the price easy. Her qualities, like Juan would call them, were good for the store. But in his house, this quality for organization drove Jose crazy. She controlled what he could eat, what he could drink, where he couldn't sit, where he couldn't put his feet. I'm accustomed, I'm accustomed to men sitting in my kitchen and talking. Jose visits, El Nang visits, my brother Rafa visits. They visit to escape from the world, you know. But I wasn't born yesterday. When a man complains about his wife to a woman that lives alone, you either bite or you don't bite. I needed a distraction from thinking of my son, Fernando, who has been gone for 10 years. So when Jose came to me, I told him to sit on the sofa in the sala and to put his feet on the coffee table with his shoes on. <laughs> ha! I served him un café, sweet like he liked it. And when he wanted to smoke a cigarillo inside, I put an ashtray on the coffee table and said, go ahead, you need a match? He lit a cigarette and forget it. Do you have whiskey, he asked. I never have liquor in the apartment because I don't like to give it to my brother Rafa, who always drinks until the bottle is finished. The next time I was ready for Jose, I bought a bottle of whiskey. When I poured the whiskey over some ice, the way he looked to me, ay papa, we became like satin. With each visit, more satin. I look good for my age. But still, it's not every day a man appears in your door like that. Jose was not ugly, tall with big shoulders and a strong nose. Are you following me? You say yes with your head like you understand, but I think you're too young to really understand. When you become my age, it's not enough to eat a lot of fish and aguacate and gallons and gallons of water to keep it juicy and tight down there. I have embarrassed you, perdón. It's just that I can never tell Lulu about Jose. If she finds out, she will curse me. She wouldn't do it on purpose. A curse is something people do without conscious. I know, I know, we have serious work to do. I'll stop there. <laughs> oh my goodness, that was such a treat because the way that you read Caras, Cara Romero, who was the main character of this book, this novel, her voice is exactly the way I imagined it in my head. And so just for people joining us and that got that taste, that small taste of who she is, tell us, tell us about this novel, who she is, what was her birth story? You know, <laughs> what brought her into this world? Because she's such a strong, powerful voice. Um, for, yeah, I thank you for saying this, Lupita. I'm always nervous to read Cara Romero because I feel people ex have high expectations. <laughs> Because she's such a great voice on the page. So I was in New York City, 2017, visiting my family. Trump was president. This is very relevant because it made I was full of despair during that time, and um, and it was the day. Um, it was it was a day of in November where the um, Trump had declared a, a Muslim ban, and there was a call on Twitter for immigrant lawyers to go to the airport. And at, I was waiting for the subway, and I was thinking, I couldn't sell my last book, Dominicana. I had been, um, I have another novel called Dominicana that came out in 2019. But in 2017, I had already received over 100 rejections from editors. And I wasn't sure that book would ever get published at that point. And I was thinking, what am I doing with my life? Maybe I should start over with a new career. Like, I'm still young enough to go back to school. Maybe I'll go become an immigration lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> and be one of the superheroes of history in the, this moment. And, um, and right there in that crowded subway, I see this woman um, in her late 50s um, reading some kind of handbook, um, studying ESL. And I started thinking of all my tias and my mother and, and my grandmother. All of them were actually laid off during the Great Recession in 2007 and 2008. And all of them had had jobs over 20 years. Wow. And I thought, what? You know, here I am thinking of starting over, and I have all these resources. I speak the language, um, thinking, what would it be like to start over at that time of your life? And I started to imagine like one of my tias like going on a job interview, yeah. 
And that day, I downloaded 50, I think it was like 40 or 50 most popular interview questions, like, what is your weakness? What is your strength? <laughs> and I couldn't imagine them answering it, like, directly. And I got on the subway, and I asked the first question, tell me something about yourself. And Cara Romero, I swear to you, came with the first sentence. Cara, my name is Cara Romero. I came to this country because my husband wanted to kill me. Wow. Don't look so shocked. I am shocked. That you was are the one line. who asked me about <laughs> yourself. And like, I said, I need to know who this person is. I might never be a writer again, but I will get to know Cara Romero. And I started writing it on my phone. And I said, you know, every time I get on the subway, on a plane, on a bus, I'm going to ask Cara Romero another question. I'm not a writer. This I'm doing just for fun. And it ended up being a novel. Yeah, and so let's talk about the structure of the novel. So for those that don't know, it's basically 12 sessions that she has with the job counselor. So could you tell us about the decision to make it into the structure? And how did you land on it and keep writing into that structure? So as you can imagine, like Cara Romero's voice came to me so strongly. And um, I spent a year asking her questions and in this mode of, am I going to continue writing? I'm doing, she's keeping me company in this moment of despair. And I kept listening to her story. And I amassed a lot of pages this way, right? And all these pages, all the things she was telling me about her life does not make a novel. Like what makes a novel is, a, is the craft of the novel. It's mm -hmm. the structure of a novel. So I had to really think about, OK, what can, how can I contain this voice that does not shut up? Yeah. Like she just wants to talk and talk and talk and talk. And I, I had to figure out, how do I translate that for the reader? And I did do some research and found out that during the recession, um, even though the majority of these women, actually it's a huge percentage of women, I think it was like 55% of women, working class women in New York City, mm -hmm. um, actually did not ever get long-term employment if they were laid off after the age of 55. Oh, wow. It's a weird age. It's like yeah. you're a little bit too old maybe to like go back to school. There was a digital divide. There was language issues. They never received, they never were able to re-enter the workforce long-term, but there were programs like job training programs and you know ESL programs and all kinds of programs in order to extend um, social um, unemployment mm -hmm. s and social security or kinds of benefits. So I said, okay, I'm going to invent a program. Yeah. It's the senior workforce program. <laughs> and Gara Romero is required to show up for 12 sessions to practice how to do an interview. And what I realized is that they sort of function like therapy, yeah. except like no one in my family would ever. Right. Like no, I, I mention right. it constantly. I'm like, you should go work on that. They're like, I have no drama. What are you talking about? I have yeah. no drama. I'm like, well, maybe you still are having pain over the fact that you didn't eat for 10 years. I don't know. You know? <laughs> Um, so, yeah, so it, it just, I created that constraint to sort of, you know, um, manage the okay. material because I had so much of it. Yeah, and, and, you know, just thinking about it and thinking about the sessions and the way she slowly kind of unfolds this story, you know, how did you, how did you manage to just reel her in and pr progress the story forward, even though there were so many moments where she's just kind of expanding? You know, I've been writing for a long time. Yeah. And I teach creative writing in, um, at NYU. So, you know, it was very useful. I think to have all this experience to really think about how can you um, honor what I would say is some of the, the, you know, the meandering, tendential, digressive ways that a lot of people tell story, right? We've, we don't see it that much in American literature, but if you read Latin American literature and literatures, you know, that are coming from India, like, and where you have multicasts and you're t you, you can't just speak about one person because in this book, Cara Romero is actually telling her story, but she's also telling the story of the community and she's telling the story of all her neighbors, right? In order to manage all that, I really had to go into um, the basics of arcs mm -hmm. and like it were a lot of maps, okay. like a lot of maps. And I said, okay, if she wants to talk about Tita, how much do I need to know about Tita? So if someone reads the book, they're going to know her enough that they won't feel frustrated, right, as a reader. Yeah. And if Lulu, her neighbor, it's not about Lulu, but how much can I, how much do I need to right. say about Lulu? And it really was like a weaving right. in and out through each session to make sure that even though it seems like she's going on tangents, 
you as a reader are like, okay, good, good, good. Because I was You're really thinking about, about Tita. Her. Like, yeah. what happened to Tita? Like, did she lose the apartment? Like, you know, so, um, yeah, but it was, it, in that way, it becomes mathematical almost. Oh, okay. It almost becomes like, I, I, like I'm organizing material and really thinking about how narratives work. And the truth is that a lot of the narratives we hear are pretty much written all in through, like in this cycle, mm -hmm. right? Like, Something happens, something has to change. Or you, you know? get pieces of it, yeah. which is what I felt like was so authentic with your character and authentic to oral storytelling, yeah. which is what this book feels like. And so did you always feel like this is what I want to do? This is I want to capture the authenticity of what it is like to sit and like be witnessed and like tell a story to someone almost uninterrupted, right? Yeah. Well, you know, the oral storytelling, I come from some of the best storytellers ever. And it took me up until, I guess, working on this novel to really honor the ways I learned how to tell story. I mean, I went to an MFA and and it had I learned a lot. I learned how many stories work and, you know, in U.S. literature. And I learned like some conventional ways of like manipulating narratives. So it's, you know, goes into the mainstream. But I. It was discredited in my mind. It wasn't really validated in the academia mm -hmm. that I come from. Already, I was training since I was a little right. kid, girl, how to tell story. And when I wrote this book, I really just wanted to lean into that. You know, I wanted to lean in to the ways we tell story, and we all do it actually. Anyone who likes like to gossip or or like <laughs> hang out at a bar and like you know or date or whatever, we're constantly doing it. We are trying to hook someone in and stay interested, so they stay with us. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just going to go away, mm -hmm. right? We're doing it. But somehow, when you start writing, you think writing should look a certain way. Yeah. And now we will move into the interiority and the depths and the yeah. whatever. But in reality, writing is really about community building. Like, storytelling is about community building. I'm telling you a story so we can have some kind of intimacy this moment, so this moment matters more, right? Mm -hmm. Or I'm telling you a story about someone else so you can start thinking about that other person. Otherwise, that person won't be part of your imagination. And I really leaned into that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, for me personally, it was like such a beautiful thing to see and to witness because, you know, even the job counselor who is speaking with her and who is in conversation with her, but she only kind of slowly pushes her sometimes to just kind of explore feelings and like a therapist. And so I was just so enamored with that and that choice. Like, did the job counselor for you ever just like say, okay, I need to say more or I need to figure out how to find out more. Yeah, you know, the job counselor was had her own part in the book yeah. initially. I had many different versions of the book and I did have a version where the, the neighbors were speaking and the counselor was speaking and all of that didn't make the book in the end, but it's kind of infused mm -hmm. in the work. But the job counselor for me, I was thinking about, we're all in that position. Like basically we're all in that position every time we are in a position of power or in a position where we could help somebody. Like, how are we listening and what kind of questions are we asking? Everybody that comes across us so we can emerge better, both of us, right? And I feel like by writing a job counselor who was just listening puts the reader in that position in yeah, a way sure. where they have to sort of, like, would anyone really sit, how many people really do sit down and listen to a person for five hours, that's how long it takes to read the book, <laughs> you know, um, and just take in the whole person with all the complexity that we are versus just, or we enter a conversation and project already what we want to hear. Mm. I'm asking this, but I already know who you are. So whatever you say, I'm not going to believe anyway. Mm. But this book doesn't let you do that. Because you might be like, oh, I know Cara Romero. I met her. I met her. She, you know, she take care of my kids. Oh, she's the person that helped me. She's my neighbor, you know. But in reality, we do that to each other all the time. And I recognize I was doing that. So, like, yeah. how I changed with this book is that I became a better listener because I was like, oh, wait. I come into my mom's house, and I already think I know what she thinks. Uh -huh. Before, I think I'm listening to her, but I'm actually not listening to her. I've already projected everything I think she is because of everything I... And then when you pay attention of how we're full of contradictions, which this character really is, her actions and what she say says is very different. Yeah. And I wanted that to come out in the book, and I wanted the reader to be like implicated. Yeah. 
yeah. right? Like I was implicated. I feel like I'm implicated in how sometimes I'm not so generous with people I don't agree with. And I mean, I told you I felt emotionally damaged by the book. And you know, I, and she's I, suing and me. <laughs> we have a lawsuit going. There's a current lawsuit <laughs> in, in the process uh, currently because, I mean, I'm so glad you brought up your mother that for me personally, as someone who is queer, who has had issues, you know, communicating and just being distant from my own mother because, you know, I am queer, it just hit so many buttons and and i love that you said that sometimes we shut off right we stop listening we project and we're, we're closed and i think that kara is is opening that for me at least personally and so i was just curious in general for you like what was the decision between you know adding in the, the queer aspect of uh kara's story you know what and i don't I, know if that's I a, feel a, it's not a plot twist no i, I, mean, I just want to say twist. i feel like i just want a prize <laughs> because really, like, the fact that someone could read a book and say something has opened in me in my relationship to someone that I've been struggling with is, like, the best gift any writer can hear. And I think that I'm really interested in estrangement and family, right? Because I always think, we love each other so much. Why can't we reach each other? Mm. Like, it is so frustrating. Mm. It is so frustrating because of a lifestyle choice. Of, of anything. I mean, I have felt estrangement with my mother because I became a writer. Yeah. I mean, she's like, I don't understand why you don't get a job with benefits. I worry about you every night. I don't sleep. Yeah. And like, still, she's like, it, it really took me being on the Turbotron in t Times Square for her to be like, okay, maybe this will work out. <laughs> uh, maybe I can sleep tonight. <laughs> maybe I sleep a little better. You know, now she's worried that I don't eat enough. I mean, whatever. But like that kind of her being like, so like under like it was like no matter what I did it's like she couldn't take me seriously in some ways I couldn't get her respect because what she wanted me to have a stable job with benefits like this was like her immigrant <laughs> dream and then at the same time and this is why I'm so interested in like I was away at a residency um, in France and I was you know it was like 10 years ago and my computer broke down and she called me and she said, how are you doing? I said, I'm really stressed. My computer broke down. Two days later, I receive a computer. She took it away from my brother. She goes, he doesn't need it. <laughs> and FedExed it yeah. and said, you only have two months to write this book. And I don't know what's going to happen, but you're there now. So she said, you know, ya te cita la cama, tiene que dormir. Yeah. Like you got you, you made your bed, right? And I was like, oh, this is her saying, I don't understand your yeah. lifestyle, right? Yeah which I think happens too yeah. in queer, you know, when, when kids come out to their parents, yeah. they're like, I do not understand why you would make a choice yeah. that's gonna ruin your life. Or, or not even <laughs> this, like, here's for me what I feel like Kara showed me is that behind all that is protection. Mm -hmm. It's a sordid, weird way to love somebody, you know, and it's, real, it's messed up in a way, and, but we don't talk about it, you know, you shut that out and, and the nuance is lost. And I think that's another thing I, I really want you to talk to us about is like creating a character that's so nuanced on the page, not just for like readers, but for you too. I felt like maybe you struggled at any point with her decisions because you guys are clearly not the same person, you know, like, and some of the things that she was doing and saying in her stories, like what was that like for you? I definitely struggle. I mean, I struggled because I like to write characters I don't understand. Uh -huh. I don't want to write anyone I know. I want to write people I want to know or understand. And especially because we are so different, you know what I mean, from each other. And, and I feel like with her, like the initial drafts weren't so loving. <laughs> they were more, again, judgmental in the way that sometimes I'll go and I'll be like, oh, you voted in tr for Trump? I hate you. And I'm like, oh, wait, but like, you're not a bad person, right? Like, you're just choosing a different way to be in the world, right? And I don't have to shut you down completely. And these kinds of things I wrestle with a lot, right? Because I don't have a lot of time and space, so I find sometimes ways to, like, box people in. Mm -hmm. And what I was doing with Kara was the same. I'm like, oh, I, I know who she is. This is who she is. And then every time I went back to the narrative, I was like, okay, how can I love you more? God, I want to love you more. Help me love you more. And I kept opening up her story, opening up her story. And in fact, I knew her son was missing because of the physical abuse. Mm -hmm. 
And then I was like, what are the things that would make a kid not come back? And that's when I, I have so many friends who haven't been able to return because they are queer and have chosen a lifestyle that their parents don't agree with. And I thought, you know, this is an important narrative. I'm the mother of a 14 year old. I want my son to know yeah. he can always come home yeah. regardless of what he chooses. Even if maybe, I don't know, my right. family w wouldn't respond to him, right? Yeah. And I don't know what he's gonna be yet. He's too young, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But I wanted a book that was like, there's possibility, there's right. openness. Right, and also a book that doesn't focus on repair. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and I don't think that I'm spoiling anything in saying that you know, as a reader, you hold on, you know, <laughs> hold on. It's a journey. It's a really good journey because, you know, we're learning. We're learning with her. We're learning. We're growing with her. And um, I just felt like in a world with social media right now where nuance is like, oh, it's it's not there. Um, it's really refreshing to have a character that is so willing to grow with somebody that you grow with as a reader. So. But yeah. thank God she has the social worker, yeah. right? So like right. what I was thinking about, like, again, we're often in positions where there are ways we can do more. Mm -hmm. We Even in our own jobs, like we realize, oh, well, there's ways that we could be, do more if we look at a person as a whole person. Yeah. And I feel like this person was really helping her see and unpack. Right. I mean, her job was to get her job, yeah. but she got to know her in this whole other way. Yeah. And, you know, I, she talks about a lot of really difficult things, but you insert so much humor into her, too. Like, even when you were doing your reading, like, it, it was hard for me not to, I'm like, I wanted to crack up. But, like, was that really important for you to insert that humor? Did it come naturally? Is it just the character that came to you on the, uh, on the train that day and was like, this is who I am, and I need you to transcribe and bring me to life? Well, you know, I do think that... Um Humor in my family has been used a lot as a way to get through <laughs> very challenging situations. I mean, just recently, I don't know if any of you have been following the news with the Hurricane Fiona that hit Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic. And, you know, I'll call someone that I know was impacted and there's like, oh, yeah, you know, this happened. And then they'll start laughing. And I'm like, is this funny? So sometimes it's really not funny and it's just a way to release mm. how hard it is. But then sometimes it really is a space of joy space where it's like, I'm not alone in this. Mm. Laughter is also like a shared kind of levity, right? When you're laughing together, there's some joy in the fact that like, oh, we're not alone. <laughs> we can laugh about it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Even though we know it's gonna be very hard. Yeah. So um, I think that's her way to cope, but also like, she has a lot of joy and yeah. I think it's important because I feel like sometimes the narratives like trauma narratives mm -hmm. it's like somos sufrida siempre you know and like and the reality is I don't think it's that simple I think yeah. all these things live concurrently right mm -hmm. like the sadness the grief the joy the you know the, the pleasure yeah. the desire it's all in the same day and sometimes in the same 30 minutes yeah <laughs> I mean it's peaks and valleys yeah. like your book took me through I will never forgive you in the best way. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's a short book, but you pack so much into there. And, and you mentioned previous drafts, like how much editing did you have to do? And do we, do we get a sequel or do we have more from this powerful voice? Um, I don't know if this would be a sequel, but she is still speaking to me, which has never happened to me before. Usually I finish a book and I close it off. But there's something about this character that I feel like keeps speaking. So I don't know what will happen with that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there was a lot of different versions of the book. And, you know, and I feel like um, it was a lot. It was because, one, we were in pandemic. And I was learning a lot in pandemic about listening mm -hmm. and being still in ways that I was so busy before pandemic, traveling, mothering, teaching that I didn't have a lot of time to sit with my own feelings about mm. many things because I was so busy, right? But pandemic, we got into our feelings. <laughs> you know, there were those months where there was nowhere oh, yeah. to go and we were really like, listen, and you know, I remember being on the phone and just like really hearing what people were saying. And I, did, I was like, wow, I have an hour to be on the phone? Like yeah. that wasn't something that I had ever had a time with, with my schedule the way it was. And that helped inform the book. And the more I was learning, right, and reading and thinking about where do we put all those feelings, especially as an immigrant daughter, where we're not, I was never encouraged to feel. Yeah. I was like, suck it up. 
Yeah. Suck it out. Yeah. Yeah. You, the world is harsh. And in fact, you know, I'm actually, you know, I used to have a, res um, I would say, I was, you know, really struggling with some, you know, younger people in my life who were like all in their emotions and, you know, and everything was hard. And then I said, you know what? That's their superpower. Mm -hmm. Sensitivity is a superpower because all my resilience, like Cara Romero is so resilient and she just showed up to work. It doesn't matter, you know, like all the microaggressions were hitting her. And she's like, it doesn't matter. I am strong. My son is weak. He's so soft and feely. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. but that's his superpower because the system is not going to change if we stay resilient. Yeah. Because we just become complicit in keeping the system working. We just become we're just doing the thing. And they're like, yeah, you see, you survived. You're good. Yeah. But we're not good. Yeah, we're not good. So every time I see this sensitivity and this kind of pushback, even though it's really a pain in the butt because it makes things, it slows us down. We're like, we just want to keep at it because we're too tired. It's their superpower, even though it's hard yeah. and it's painful. It's painful for everybody to be called racist, to be called homophobic, to, to tell the system that they, you know, like they they shouldn't be using money from the pharmaceuticals. Like, right. you know, like, wait, wait, how are we going to have a museum if we don't use the money from this? Why are you all being so conscious now? Like, stop it. Mm -hmm. But it's actually important, and it's, I don't know where we're going to go with it. Yeah. But that's also the tension. Right. Gara was from, like, I suck it up. I also was, I yeah. sucked it up. Now yeah. I have a kid, and I'm like, I don't want you to be go. No, I'm I don't want you to suck I'm it up. A, I'm all <laughs> thick skinned. Yeah. I'm like, I don't want you to be, I have like feelings. that you're sensitive. You know, and then you're calling me out. That's good. So <laughs> you you would say you did a lot of unlearning through oh her, God, like, yes. you and know. I thought I had unlearned. Because I feel like I got free therapy. Um, <laughs> so I'm not going to ask you if you went to therapy <laughs> writing this, but I mean. I mean, I did. I did start therapy. But I, I would say, too, that I thought I was woke, mm. right? Like, I thought I had done a lot of decolonization. <laughs> in my own body and my own mind because I've been studying for so long mm -hmm. about the system and injustice and all of this but then there's more to learn and there will always be more to learn and that's the thing too it's a process we're going to keep learning it's like you don't arrive anywhere Gada doesn't arrive anywhere yeah. I mean she she's like little bits like all of us and then we keep learning and that's exciting because I mean like what are we doing we're alive for a reason we got to yeah. do something um, I, I know I'm looking at the time. I know we, I'm going to open it up to audience questions. Um, so if you have a question, you can line up. But I do have a million more questions for you, obviously. <laughs> um, but before we get to audience questions, I just was curious, really, um, what, what other books would you say would be in conversation with her? And I'm saying her, I know, I feel like her, the book's theme should have been Cara Romero. Just like big, bold, you know? Yeah, you know. <laughs> It's, it's funny, um, now in retrospect, people think Cara Romero wrote the book herself. <laughs> and someone said, don't you feel weird that no one thinks you wrote the book? And I said, it's okay, it's a compliment too. Yeah. She's so alive that people think you know she wrote the book. Um, you know, it's funny, I actually think, I'm gonna plug it right now, Elizabeth Acevedo is coming out with an adult fiction novel. Did you read it? it? I started reading it and she's in conversation with Cara Romero. <laughs> So that was very exciting. I would say um, Neruda in the Park. Okay. Um, yeah. Clavis Natera. Clavis Natera's Neruda, Neruda in the Park also in that yeah. same sphere, right? Like women who are just really trying to take care of their community and mm -hmm. very different, but in conversation. Um, yeah, I would stop there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I was reading an interview you did and you said that this book opens up conversations. So... Just curious, what kind, what, what conversation, the most important conversation that you wish it would open up for readers as they're reading? And I know that's a big question. You know what? I don't, I don't have an agenda. Okay. Like, I feel like I put the book out there and I'm always excited to hear what would come back. But I did have a really powerful conversation with someone who read the book and it surprised me. Mm -hmm. And that always is exciting for me. Mm -hmm. And it was that she got to a part of the book where Cara Romero um, is, being, is, is being offered the possibility to go on an interview for a security guard in a school. And the person who was interviewing me at the time works in Texas. And she said when she read the description of security guard, she just started bawling because of Uvalde. Mm. And she said, I am never ever, after reading this book, ever gonna look at a security guard in the same way. Because if you think about everything they're supposed to do, mm -hmm. 
but and then imagine someone who has all these other things going on in their lives, right? Mm -hmm. We are so much more than our jobs. Yeah. And yet we expect people to perform. And I see it all the time. I was on the train and someone's like yelling at the, per the train conductor because they got double booked. And I said, that's not their fault. Yeah. And who knows what they're holding? They're yeah. here, just showed up to their job. Something went wrong technically with the, you know, the tickets. And the person's so angry at them. Like, and I said, this is not the way we should move in the world. We don't know what people are carrying, right? Yeah. So like those conversations are always interesting because when someone's like responding to the book in a way that I didn't even imagine and it was so connected to Valde and what happened there, yeah. like that was surprising to me. Yeah, and were there any other surprising reactions you had? I mean, other than me trying to sue you, I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> in, that you've had from readers? Well, this uh, I've said it before, but I really love this. Another person, um, she went shopping for basmati rice because she uses basmati rice, but she decided to buy jasmine rice. And she said, yeah, you know, Kara said, and then she realized that Kara was a fictional character. So she, <laughs> so she wrote me an email and said, this is very strange, but I think Kara Romero is, yeah. is like influencing my, my grocery shopping. Yeah. I don't know what to say about that, <laughs> but I love it. <laughs> and um, how do you feel about when people tell you they cried because I, I I'm gonna agree with you know the events director here I I sobbed I mean when I say emotional damage I mean like I was like I was didn't understand why I was crying you know the kind of cries I don't know if has anyone cried like that before you're like I don't even know why I'm crying I'm just crying I mean isn't that the power of literature like I mean I feel like the one thing literature can do is give you like this intimate space with another being where it unpacks something, you don't even know what it is, right? Like, it's kind of like a magic trick in literature. It's like the good ones really just move something in you. They make you laugh, they make you cry. And um, and I think, again, when someone tells me this, I'm like, okay, maybe I did something right. You never know yeah. when you're writing, but when you receive the response, you're like, oh my God, it worked. Whatever that was I was trying to do worked. <laughs> And I mean, you didn't intentionally go in and say, I'm going to make people cry, yeah. you know? Never, <laughs> like, never. Yeah. I don't, but I, I just yeah. stay true to the character. Right. And what it makes me think is that, oh, something about this read true to you. Right. Yeah. No, absolutely. I feel like I'm stealing the time. Um, so audience questions. Anyone have any questions that they're, they want to ask? If not, I mean, don't be shy. I probably shouldn't say this, but I didn't read the book. I listened that's, that's to okay. it. That's oh. <laughs> okay. In a bookstore, it sells books. We buy lots of books here. And I loved it. I just loved it. I loved the voices. I loved the actresses, actors who, who played the parts in it. And one of the additional things I love that you haven't mentioned is that is the structure of the forms the car had to fill out. Mm -hmm. Because um, I guess I originally studied sociology. And so for me, it wasn't just about her, it was about the system mm -hmm. for anyone seeking a job. And I thought that, that um, enlarged the story and the meaning for me. So I wanted to just mention that to, to people. Oh, thank you yeah. for bringing that up. So the book, woven through it, there are all these documents, right? Like an application for citizenship. Yeah. A lot of my laughs came from this part of the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was like uh, a lease to an apartment, um, the actual job application, security questions um, that we get when we try to enter a system. And um, you know, one of the things I do is that I read a lot of poetry and I think a lot about like why in poetry the language is so concentrated, it needs space and sometimes they play on the page to sort of give the reader rest and breath, which also has emotional impact. So I've been thinking, I thought a lot about that during writing Dominicana, and I thought the same thing with this character. She's giving us a lot, right? Like, she ran away from her country, her husband's trying to kill her, her son is missing, and all this stuff. And the forms, in some ways, allow the reader to have breath, right? Like, okay, and then you laugh, right? Because she really goes at it to these forms, and in the end, there was a way that I worked on it, not with the intention of like poking at the system, but like everything I believe about the system I'm poking at. So it came out, you know, in the ways that I was writing her responses to these questions. And I do think it's an important part of the book because gentrification is an issue for all the characters and 
how to show that through the forms and you know and who who's allowed into this country and who's not allowed and how are we validated like all of it shows up in those forms and helps also counteract or maybe support some of the things Kara is saying in the story that you might not actually totally believe yeah and I mean you think about filling out those forms incorrectly which she she does and those are the moments that are laughable but, but also like just the amount of time that it would probably take for her to process to get pro a form processed because it's not filled in correctly is part of that you know what I have a this is an aside but I actually you know because I in my research I filled out a lot of these forms as Cara Romero and I did a lot of these things for Cara Romero and one of the ones I did was I took a codependency test for as Cara Romero and it was hysterical because basically Latinx people if you go down it was like what's wrong yeah. everything I said is right you yeah. know but like yeah. it's a diagnosed or a severe codependent right. it was amazing <laughs> I loved it that's that's <laughs> yeah I would not I don't know if I would want to fill out a form right now that but <laughs> yeah. it was very funny but yeah like the forms are really useful in getting to know the character but also you know um supporting the stories she was telling yeah. and it, it was great were you worried about including the forms at all like you know because it's so unique it's not something that we often see in novels and you know you know it's funny I think that if Dominicana hadn't been such a success I might have been more worried because I would have been like is anyone gonna understand this you know but I feel like after Dominicana and also because I started this book at a point where I was just like you know what nobody cares about what I'm doing anyway it really freed me I feel like this is the book that I feel the freest from reception right so yeah in, in some ways I was like I hope it works I had so much fun <laughs> You know, and I think it worked. So I'm happy. Yeah, no, I I mean it worked. I loved. I love that. I believe I, you. I loved it. <laughs> Do we have any more questions from the audience? Or is anyone shy? You're fine. <laughs> I think we have a mic there. Yeah. I'm just curious to know um, your writing process, like, and the way that the book reads, it doesn't feel like. You're being overly descriptive. It just, it literally feels like you're in a conversation with Kata directly. So I can see how like a lot of people assume she's the author. Um, and you mentioned like how she talks to you, like the way that you wrote. So I'm curious to know like for the surrounding characters, do they speak to you as well? Or like how did they kind of develop? Or how did you write about them? So no, the other characters, did, she told me about all the characters. And then I did try. There were drafts of the book where I had, for example, her neighbor Lulu, who has a big part in the book. I had her write the story like I thought oh well could I make a book just on monologues like could it be a novel like I really started to think about the craft of it and like wondering if the genre could hold right like that could hold in the novel genre and then I wrote Lulu and I wrote you know and I thought okay this is working this is working I submitted it you know to my editor and then you know I, I submitted it and I thought this is what the book is going to be like and then I was having a conversation with my friend who had heard some of the earlier stuff and I started talking about the book. She goes, do you know when you talk about this book you never mention Lulu ever? Mm. And I say, what do you mean? She goes, I think you don't love her as much as Kara. And I said, I don't think I love her as much as Kara. <laughs> and I pulled the book out and I said to my editor, I said, oh my God, I'm rewriting the book. She's like, what are you, what, what are you talking about? We have a deadline. <laughs> There's a deadline. I was like, Nope, I want Kara to tell the story. And But what ended up happening, if you're a writer, is that all that time I spent with Lulu is now inside of Kara's voice. So I basically just t took that information and sometimes you just need time to get to know a person. Yeah, but she never really spoke to me. I was like trying to, it was like I was lying on the page. I mean, and is it terrible to ask if you had, other than Kara, did you have a character that you wish you could have explored more? I mean, I th there were so many great ones. Yeah, you know, I w had wanted to write Fernando, the missing son. Yes. I wanted yes. him to have a voice, but then I just, I don't know, it just didn't feel true either. Mm. I felt like there was something about her story. I wanted, an, I wanted it to be as honest as possible, and and it just didn't work. I think we have a question. Yeah. Oh, one of the things that I've noticed so far, I'm 
only a little ways in, but I've noticed the appearance of a character who also, that type of character also came up in Dominicana. So I'm wondering if you can speak to the role of the ESL teacher or the English language teacher um, in the lives of the, the women characters that you're writing and what you feel like is important for those people in those roles to be and do. Do you do ESL? I do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's really funny because, okay, the f you're going you're gonna to be like, what kind of writer says she like, writes the book in 500 different ways? So one of the versions of the book, Cara was only speaking in Spanish, oh, wow. right? So Dominicana, the character was only speaking in Spanish. Um, and I felt very comfortable there because I said, oh, I, I, I figured that one out, right? Like I could do that one. In this version, I said, oh, I want to play with prepositions. Mm. And you know, as an ESL teacher, that really hard to get the prepositions right. That's like one, I, I, I actually, I'm, you know, I just been speaking Italian for the past 10 years and this is like where I always struggle, the past tense, the present tense, and the prepositions. So I rewrote the book thinking, what if she's an English second language speaker? And then it opened up an entire world of meaning for words because it was like when I was playing with it, I said, ooh, making these mistakes are actually not mistakes. It's actually opportunity. So what does it mean when we're learning a new language? I think is getting rid of the shame of the misspeak mm -hmm. and thinking about the opportunity. Like what do we learn about the English language? How can we expand it to include the breadth of Latino culture, Spanish speaking culture, multicultural, like living in two different dimensions, the multiverse, what we call, you know, like when I saw there was this movie, Everything, Everywhere, All yeah, at Once. so good. And someone said, oh yeah, that's what it's like to be an immigrant because we literally are in the multiverse. Mm -hmm. We're living in five <laughs> different verses mm -hmm. every day, yeah. right? Oh, I mean, that's accurate. <laughs> it's like, right? And in some ways I saw it visible, like yeah. in that movie. And I think that's true with language. Like language makes visible, even in the mistakes, the multiverses, multi-realities that we're living and instead of shaming us, it's like, okay, well, in order to get a job, you should, this is the correct way. But actually, the way that you just expressed it adds new possibility to this other way of thinking about this work. That doesn't, it's not about shame, it's almost like a new language, mm -hmm. right? Thank you. <laughs> uh, do we have any more other questions? No? Wow. Um, just building on that, really, and I'm thinking about, you know, what you mentioned, and I think about Spanish and how, you know, in terms of our, like, culture, you know, Mexican Spanish is so different, Dominican Spanish is so different, but English, it just feels, like, so rigid, right? And and I feel like Gara is showing us that, right, in a sense, because you talk to us about the way she does that in the novel. Yeah, English feels rigid to us because we have another language we're yeah, playing right, right. with. <laughs> For people, that's their only language. It's cool. Yeah. And that's cool too, right? Like, you have to accept whatever it is that your, you know, sandbox, right? We all have our own sandbox and whatever the sand and the toys are in there. That's what we use. The problem is the shaming as if something is wrong with you mm. because you're moving in two languages or three languages. And I, you know, I raised a kid who's speaking three languages and there's so much shaming yeah. around language in schools where it's like, I was like, hold it. Like this kid is moving through three languages, three different realities, three different cultures. We should be celebrating and supporting him. Mm -hmm. But instead there was this pushback and if it wasn't for me, because I'm just like, well, I don't care if you get a B and everything. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm glad you speak three languages, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it ended up paying off in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and even though we, I struggled to find the right teachers that understood that it was a gift. Mm -hmm. But believe it or not, it's usually seen as not a gift, right. as a detriment. Yeah. 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 And I feel like that's very scary when actually there's a lot of possibility in even the misspeaks, like I'm saying. Like, right. I think we're learning a lot about language because of this. And we think about Spanglish, you know, and that's its own little language. Its own language. Yeah, and, and, and it's gorgeous, it's beautiful. It's like a marriage of two different languages that do kind of belong together, because language is 
open. Right, and everyone can learn it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, last question. Um, what's next? Oh, for me. Unless, like, unless anyone has any other questions, I don't want to hog. Oh, go on. Um, what's next? You know, it's hard for me to speak about what's next because I don't know now. I mean, I do, I do have a book, and it's supposed to be in the works, but I'm really just enjoying right now. I, I feel like I didn't have a minute to really enjoy even this book because I had to work so hard to meet the deadline. And now I'm just enjoying like what God is doing, and I feel like it's going to lead me to the project I want to focus on the most because I have like three cooking. Ooh. So, yeah. So I, I don't know. I can't answer that question right now. I mean, I'm excited Sorry. for the three cooking. No, you don't. I mean, just give me something. You gave me something. Um, well, thank you so much for talking to me today. Thank you for pol to Politics and Prose for hosting us. Um, this has been amazing. And I hope everyone gets a copy of the book for your friends, your enemies, because, I mean, <laughs> make them laugh. Like, right? We're a community. We're a community. It's totally. And thank you. You're an amazing audience, truly. Thank you. Thank you.